So thank you for coming this afternoon to our public lecture for this week. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to make sure people know what's happening next week. Next week we have Dr. Randy Babbitt. He's a professor of physics at the um, Montana State University, and he's going to talk on optical crystals versus supercomputers, the future of signal processing. So it's kind of a different topic from today. Um, and that talk is going to be over in ELC 202, so it's across campus. But today, we're really fortunate to have with us Dr. Alan Sessoms. Now, I've known Alan since at least sometime in the 90s. It's a long time ago. It's been a, a, a bit ago. Um, and Alan is one of the few people who have had more jobs than I have. But he is a couple of years older, so I am working on catching up. Um, uh, he is currently a distinguished professor at Georgetown University. Previously, he has worked for the State Department, both in Washington on nuclear weapons stuff in Paris and in Mexico as a deputy ambassador. He's been the president of three universities. Uh, let's see. Um, Delaware State University is one. The University District of Columbia is the other, and the other one Queen's is College. New York City. Yeah, yeah. Queen's College. Queen's College. Queen's College in New York City. Uh, he's been a research physicist and experimental physicist. He got his undergraduate degree from Union, Union College, College yep. in New York City. New York State. New York State, New York State, right. And his um, PhD in experimental particle physics from Yale University. He's worked at Fermi Lab. He's worked at the European Center for Nuclear Research in Geneva. Um, he's probably worked at Brookhaven. And um, he has uh, bringing his physics technical background to many issues in the science policy arena and in the public dialogue gives him a particular distinctive um, perspective that he'll be sharing with us today when he talks about physics and science policy implications of reduction in the US nuclear weapons arsenal. So Alan. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you for pointing out the I'm older than you, I really appreciate that. Um, I have a technical question. How many people know how to design nuclear weapons? Just raise your hands. Okay. <clears throat> how many of you have studied anything about nuclear weapons? Okay. How many of you care about nuclear weapons? <laughs> That's good. Okay. <laughs> I have spent <clears throat> a bunch of time thinking about and working on the, uh, the science policy implications of what we all would like to see, what President Obama would like to see, and that is the zero nuclear weapons in the world. And it turns out that with that fairy tale, we do other things. Because it's just, I'll, I'll tell you why it's a fairy tale. Uh, it's a very nice thing to think about, but simply isn't possible. So since there is this nuclear weapons arsenal that we have, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, there is reason to expect that if you have nuclear weapons or any kind of weapons, you want to make sure if you need them, they're going to work. Uh, and the hope is with nuclear weapons, you won't need them. But if people who might be your adversaries think that your nuclear weapons aren't going to work, then you might as well not have them. And if they have some confidence that they will work, then you won't have to use them. So it's, a, it's an interesting mix. Uh, what that allows us to do is think about what we can do with the constraints that we have in the real world to maintain a nuclear weapons arsenal so we don't have to use it, and also what opportunities that gives to folks like you, not you, folks like you, that were born after 1990, uh, or maybe after 1985, to, to think about where career paths might lay in some non-traditional fields. And also there's a lot of money being spent, so we might as well see how the taxpayers are doing it. Uh, so there's a mushroom cloud. That's a picture of a, a typical atmospheric nuclear test, which was banned uh, by the limited test ban treaty that the US and Russia, China, France, and the UK adhere to. So when we agreed we weren't going to set up nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, it turned out to be a major positive step except that we continue testing on the ground. But in underground, you don't get nice pictures like this, so I'll show you a nice picture. Uh, that's a big bomb. 
This bomb is a picture, is a picture of a demolition cloud from the, the weapon that was dropped on Nagasaki in Japan in 1945. Now, you should know something about this bomb. This was a very complicated bomb. It was complicated because it was a plutonium bomb. And that'll be important later. And plutonium happens to be radioactive. So you have to do special things to get it together so it doesn't melt and fizz before it all comes together. If it's uranium, the, point, the beauty of uranium is it's not radioactive. Basically, you can hold it in your hand. You can eat it if you want to. In fact, some weird people do that. If you, if you get these uh, interesting glasses that are sort of iridescent green from some of the Indian reservations, the iridescent green is uranium oxide. And you drink it out of them, so it's not a big deal. Uh, this is the bomb we tested uh, in Alamogordo in 1945 to make sure it worked. The uranium bomb was never tested. We knew it would work the first time. So the technology we're talking about is 70 years old, 70 plus years old. It is not high tech, just so you know. So anybody can make one of these things, any nation can make one of these things and put some resources into it. This is before computers. This is before the internet. This is before any of that stuff. And in fact, anybody who has a smartphone has more computing power that everybody had when they designed these nuclear weapons on your phone. So you can design them if you want to. I wouldn't advise it, but hey, what the heck. I couldn't find a picture of the Hiroshima bomb. That was a uranium bomb that went off. But that's what was left of Hiroshima after it went off. That was a picture taken by folks from the Atomic Energy Commission, the first folks that came in after the bomb dropped. And it made a mess made a mess. Uh, 20, 30,000 people killed from the blast effects alone. And after that, the radiation effects probably sickened or killed another 100,000. We're still counting, actually. We don't know that the blast effects are much more clear than the radiation effects in this circumstance. This was a 20 kiloton bomb. 20,000 tons of TNT effect made this mess. This is a much bigger bomb. This bomb is one of the biggest bombs the US has ever set off. It was about five or 10 megatons, about 1,000 times bigger than the one that made a mess of Hiroshima. And this picture is a test from 1954. This, this is also one of the biggest bombs we ever set off. I just put it up because it's kind of Cool, they had contact. This is a, a fusion weapon, thermonuclear weapon. This was probably closer to 10 megatons. They, the number that it was is still somewhat classified. It's embarrassing. I mean, what do you do with something that big? I mean, it's, it's embarrassing, actually. Um, so nuclear weapons have been around for a long time, and we have a lot of them. And the Russians had a lot of them. And they were very useful during a time when we and the Russians were facing each other or through the Cold War and nobody wanted to do anything crazy. So instead of dropping bombs on each other, we just let other people kill each other for us through proxy wars. But it led to a stability in global affairs that simply doesn't exist now. If there was a Soviet Union as a bad guy, we wouldn't have all these crazy things going on all over the place because we'd be protecting our own turf. The Soviet Union would have been able to protect more of its own turf and we ours with some influence, because everybody else would be scared, and you wouldn't have all these crazy things happening. So during the Cold War, we had stability. And with the demise of the Soviet Union, the stability went away. But nuclear weapons were a major part of that. The problem with nuclear weapons is that they're useful to other countries. This is a, a Tony Auth drawing from 19, <coughs> 2003. This is Bill Clinton in the corner, talking to, to uh, then uh, head of North Korea. And in a speech, Clinton had called North Koreans a bunch of pygmies. You know, we don't have to worry about these guys. This is Mickey Mouse country. You know, what do they do? They're poor. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> well, after they tested a nuclear weapon, it was pretty much of a fizzle, but they still tested it. All of a sudden, they were no longer pygmies. They were former pygmies. It made a huge difference in the profile of North Korea. As an aside, we could have stopped this program before it got going, the North Korean nuclear program. And I had the 
the good fortune of being one of the, in fact, probably the first person to brief the South Koreans on the, the North Korean program. And they said, OK, that's very nice. Uh, now that you've told us, what should we do about it? I said, well, I don't know. What do you want to do about it? So we can take it out. Because it was, they just had a, a bunch of blocks of carbon, basically. They were building the reactor from. And it, there, was no fuel, there was no fuel in it. So you go and you blow up a bunch of carbon blocks and nothing happens. So I said, well, that's above my pay grade. I'll go and ask somebody. And we took it back to Washington. And then President Ronald Reagan said, well, no, it's above my pay grade, too. I don't want to be bothered with this and let it go. And now this is what we have. But they're also political, politically useful to rogue states. So this is another picture of the North Korean uh, leader. I don't have to call him more than that who's talking to somebody from the Middle East with F-16s floating around his head, they're ours, and like flies, he says, well, you know, it's the only thing that keeps them away. So politically, nuclear weapons are very useful in the hands of folks that you would not like to get them. And that's one of the biggest problems we face today. And I'll, I'll mention that a little later in more detail. Kim Jong-il. This was Kim Jong-il. Yeah. We have a problem right now with the Iranians. So the Iranians have a nuclear program underway for peaceful purposes, they say. And there's a lot of discussion about what that means. Some of us know what it means, but they have a propaganda piece. I think they're beginning to discover that nuclear weapons may not be in their best interest, but having the capability to develop nuclear weapons might be. So they're pushing ahead with a nuclear program. Uh, this is a, a former president, Ahmadinejad, um, walk, walking through a cascade of centrifuges in a facility at Nantes in, in Iraq, in Iran, excuse me. <clears throat> and here's the problem with uranium enrichment. Natural uranium, the stuff you can get out of the ground or out of seawater, is less than 1% U-235. The, the useful component for nuclear weapons in uranium or for power is uranium-235. Uh, the naturally occurring abundances is 0.73% U-235 and the rest of the stuff. And the rest of the stuff is U-238. So you have to separate out the useful U-235 from the heavier stuff. So you spin it in the centrifuge, it's a mechanical device, and you scoop the light stuff out. Because the faster you spin it, the heavy stuff stays in the middle, more to the middle, the light stuff goes to the outside, you got to scoop. And you scoop it out. It really is a scoop. It's really it's kind of interesting. So the Iranians said, we've enriched uranium only up to 20% enrichment, U-235 versus U-238, as opposed to 0.73%. And you know, that's not a big deal. We can't use it for nuclear weapons. We want to use it for other things. And the problem with that is that if it takes, for example, let me give you a 20,000 centrifuges to go from 0.73% to 20%, it takes a number like 4,000 to go from 20% to 100%. Because you've done most of the work to move it up from less than 1% to 20%, and then it's the rest of the way. That assumes, however, that the centrifuges are the same old centrifuges you use to get to 20%. The biggest problem in negotiations now with the Iranians is that they want to use newer centrifuges. So if you replace these old centrifuges with the newer ones that are 10 times more capable, you only need 400 centrifuges, say, to go up. And that's why folks are totally freaking out. The Israelis are saying, no centrifuges at all. Forget the uranium enrichment nonsense. Because if there's an opportunity for these guys with a stockpile of 20% enriched uranium to make nuclear weapons in two weeks with 400, we're done. And they're also saying, get rid of the 20%, because we don't trust them anyway. Even if they don't have centrifuges, we don't trust these guys, because you get a building one-tenth the size of this, it's easy to hide 400 centrifuges. You couldn't detect them. And then how long would it take to produce enough for a couple of weapons? A couple of weeks. And then how long would it take for folks to respond to knowing that they did it? So you go to the UN, you sit there and fight with Congress, you talk to everybody's mother, and nothing happens. And they got away with it. So the Israelis are just like, you got to be kidding me. But we want to cut a deal because we don't want to go to war with them. 
it's an interesting exercise. So there's a report that I participated in with a bunch of folks a long time ago about why you want to bother with this stuff anyway. Why do you care about nuclear weapons in the 21st century in the US uh, national security interest? So we came to a bunch of conclusions. And I'll just highlight a couple of them. The first one is the most important one. And that is, as long as anybody has them, we have to have them. For the reasons I gave. It, it, it deters folks from messing with you. And it can keep other folks from coming to the conclusion that they can use nuclear weapons against anybody else. So what we have is a, 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 state, a state of affairs where the US has got these credible nuclear weapons. It keeps the Russians at bay, and they're relying more on nuclear weapons, at least if you believe Vladimir Putin. And they say, well, look, we don't really care what the, the Americans say. We are a nuclear weapon state. We can wipe you out. So if we want to invade Ukraine, deal with it. Some people think it's a bad idea. Uh, the third bullet is fake. My opinion, it's just, it's just fake. Uh, the total, deterring global conventional war between major powers, that's also fake. It's already happening. I mean, it's just, and besides, most of the threats now are non-state actors. What are you going to do, drop a nuclear weapon on a non-state actor? So you talk about the Israelis worrying about somebody dropping a nuclear weapon on them. If the Iranians dropped a nuclear weapon on the Israelis, it would be like dropping them in their own bedroom. I mean, you have to be stupid to do that. That's not the problem. The problem is the threat. It's that, that real concern, and it's an existential threat. So there you go. And then the rest is, you know, just... We're, we're, we're macho, we want to you know, stay macho. Um, this is the thing that's complicated. How do you keep folks who know about nuclear weapons interested in sustaining the credibility of the nuclear weapons complex? So you got these weapons. They're old. It turns out that nuclear weapons are sufficiently strange that there's an art to it. What happened back in the day I wasn't around, this is what I was told, is that folks would go and test these things. They put them together and do some calculations. They draw pictures literally on pieces of paper. And they would test it and see if it worked on the ground. If it didn't work, they would tweak it. And if it worked, they would freeze the design, having no idea why it worked. Okay. That's the problem. So you have these nuclear weapons in the arsenal. Some of them are tested more than others, but it's an art. In some sense, we don't know why things don't work when they don't work. This is why testing has been very important. So <clears throat> there are a lot of folks who know how to do this, because they're the ones who tweet. Well, they get old. Some of them are already gone. And you need a lot of really bright people who care about this stuff to have a credible nuclear weapons deterrent. Because people got to believe that the folks who work, are working on it know enough to keep working. So they got to be a bunch of smart people who really want to do this, and that's the story. Uh, the idea then of stockpile stewardship, which is a code word for give me more money out of the Department of Defense, is to maintain the credible nuclear weapon stockpile. And you need people. The most important part of this whole exercise is people. Well, the problem with the nuclear weapons complex is that there are a lot of guys who are really smart, some women, not many, some women, mostly guys who are really smart, who want to publish their stuff. They want to become world famous. They want to win prizes for this and that. But they're all, it's all classified stuff. So they're fighting to get their stuff out, even though some people think it's a bad idea. So some really clever people decided to invent a way of attracting young minds to this business and getting their stuff out. And I'll talk about that in a minute. OK, this is all blah, blah, and you can look at this later. But reversing Russia's apparent increasing reliance on nuclear weapons is also over because they're increasingly relying on nuclear weapons. So I wrote this before they went crazy in Ukraine. And it's, uh, it's tough. We have reduced our stockpiles dramatically. Uh, back in the day, 
we had a lot of nuclear weapons. Okay, we're talking over 30,000 nuclear weapons. The average yield of these nuclear weapons, some of them dialable, was a megaton. I don't know what you do with it, but that's, that's what it was. Anyway, so we started to, we kind of deal with the Russians, then the Soviets, and we started to build down the nuclear weapon stockpile, because even reasonable, most reasonable people thought, we don't need all this stuff. Even Henry Kissinger thought, this is crazy, we don't need all this stuff. Besides, it would take a lot of money to maintain it. So we started building it down and started building it down. And we got down to a pretty low number. And in Prague, on April 5th, the President of the United States declared, we want to go to zero nuclear weapons. You know, everybody cheered. It was a wonderful idea uh, then. Nobody's cheering now, but it was a wonderful idea then. But that was a commitment at the highest level of government to try to get that number down from 31,000 to zero. And then we wrote a report, the American Physical Society wrote this report, on the technical steps necessary to support the nuclear arsenal downsizing. And anybody who cares about this can look this up. And if you care about this, I worry about you. But, okay. The key points from the science and technology perspective is that you have to verify the process of downsizing and dismantling the nuclear weapons we're doing. If the Russians say, oh, we're doing it too, are we going to believe them? Would you believe him? No. Well, I wouldn't believe him. He's probably cheating on his girlfriend. So the, you got to verify. And the idea is how to do that. Yet, again, it's manpower. How do you sustain the capability and expertise to ensure that what we have is safe? And you also want to ensure, a la the Iranians, that people who are pretending or people who are developing nuclear power for peaceful purposes don't end up misusing it. There's a story in this. So, when I was working in the State Department, we had the, the good fortune of dealing with uh, India when they were building their civilian nuclear power plant. <coughs> and they got this reactor from the Canadians. I call it Kandu reactors, a heavy water reactor, it doesn't really matter. But it was all on international agreements and totally safe, and everybody cared about it, and the Canadians were there all the time. And then they set off a nuclear weapon made from the material from that reactor. And folks said, hey, no, <laughs> we have a problem here. And the Pakistanis did it slightly differently. They did the same thing. A more complicated case was South Africa. When I was in the State Department, we were dealing with South Africa during apartheid, which was a very strange time for lots of, lots of people. And we went, and we knew the South Africans had a a nuclear program, they had lots of uranium, they had one of the biggest uranium finds in the world, and they were not messing around, we thought, except for the peaceful use of nuclear energy, and we were going to help them build a nuclear reactor. When apartheid fell, and some of us knew this, when apartheid collapsed, they declared to us that they had an arsenal of 30 nuclear weapons. <coughs> Done. Uranium, enriched in small pockets, Assembled, we had guys walking around there with chewing gum on their shoe trying to see if they could pick up any signs of highly enriched uranium. Missed the whole thing. And they went to here, we got it, we want to get rid of them now because we know what to do with them. So what do you do? Well, politically it was pretty stupid anyway, because what do you do with them? I mean, is South Africa going to bomb yourself? I mean, it's just kind of crazy stuff. But nonetheless, that's one of the problems. This is not hard stuff. It's easy stuff. The hard stuff is knowing that the old stuff is still working. The easy stuff is making new stuff, making new weapons. This is all sorts of stuff. Suppose somebody, for example, sets off a nuclear weapon, and they do it on San Francisco. How do you know who did it? You can't react to something like that unless you know who did it. So you have to go through a whole nuclear forensics thing. You have to understand how to deal with what we call nuclear archaeology. You need to go down and, and figure out who did what, check out their facilities to find out whether they really have facilities that could do this. I mean, it's, it's a gigantic exercise in trying to figure out stuff. These things are really interesting and complicated. And that's enough. So every, ten, no, every four years, there's a nuclear posture review 
which is done by the Department of Defense. And Bob Gates and Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State, Steve Chu when he was Secretary of Energy, all starkly, you can see how happy they are talking about this, right? Everybody's smiling. Talking about, okay, we got these nuclear weapons, what are we gonna do with them? How do we, how do we argue, A, is they're useful, and B, we know they will work when we use them? Well, back in 1985, when nuclear weapons were hanging over everybody's head, it was like a sword of Damocles. This is an Oliphant drawing, a fantastic uh, political cartoonist who really understood some things about the U U American psyche that many people really miss. And the quote, you might not be able to read this, is actually after 40 years, I really give it a thought. This thing is hanging over everybody's head. Well, the nuclear posture review is going to say, okay, how do we get that thing from over everybody's head? How do we make it useful for everybody and reduce the risk that somebody might come after us? I mean, that's what it was all about. Well, the president made another speech, uh, and he met with uh, Medvedev, who was president, uh, president and puppet of Russia at the time, and Putin was in charge, but that's all right. Uh, and he said, we expect to get down to 3,000 to 3,500 uh, nuclear warheads, which is a factor of 10 reduction from the top of the Cold War. And then at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Trading Review Conference, Hillary Clinton, for the first time, revealed, this is a classified number, don't ask me why, that the US total arsenal of nuclear warheads was down to 5,133. Shocking statement. I don't know why, but the Russians were just, they couldn't believe we said that. Well, if you've got 5,000 of these things, 200 of which can annihilate the entire country. I mean, but these, these are the games we were playing with the Russians. We were playing strange games with classified information, most of which should be in the public domain anyway. But nuclear weapons have that kind of cachet. They're kind of different than other kind of weapons because you can kill a lot of people all at once and that's the way it is. So this is the president shaking Medvedev's hand saying, we're going to go and reduce stockpiles together, and you know, we, we are going to be absolutely certain we're going to understand how our weapons work well. And he also hinted that we would help them, help them maintain their stockpile. So they would have credibility as well. Well, that's not happening. But anyway, it was a good handshake. And these are the number of weapons that have been dismantled year by year. This, this was classified until a little while ago. Of the nuclear weapons dismantlement. So it's pretty good. I mean, you have to take these things apart. You got to figure out what to do with stuff. So, so you take a nuclear weapon apart. So you have plutonium, for example. What do you do with it? Plutonium has only one use, really. That's blowing people up. You can say you can use it in nuclear power plants, but it's really expensive. It's much more expensive than using just standard uranium fuel. And it's also one of the most poisonous substances on Earth. Once you have it, you have it, you know. It, it only has a half-life of a couple of billion years. So, you know, <laughs> what do you do with this stuff? That's been one of the exercises. And also nuclear weapons have gotten fancier. The bomb that was dropped, Fat Man, that was the bomb that was dropped on uh, Nagasaki. Nagasaki. That was a Nagasaki bomb. It's big. I've got pictures of the guy standing, actually smiling. And the MK... 17, that was one of the, the big bombs that we use on some of the, the B-52s. Those are blockbuster bombs, those are megaton and so on. And it got down to them being smaller than people. Uh, and they were the same, were the same power, same with the power. There are some that we produced that were sufficiently embarrassing that they don't have pictures of it that were much smaller than the Merv warheads. Much smaller, <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, but these things progressed and progressed and they became sort of toys. You know, people did it because they could do it. And there, were, there, were, there was an article in the New York Times, I think uh, maybe a month ago, about atomic munitions that folks could put in backpacks and run into the field and set them up and get away and detonate them in case they had to. Well, we never did. 
But there, that wasn't the smallest nuclear weapon we ever produced. It was one that was dialable from 10 kilotons to a megaton in an attaché case. That was embarrassing. I don't think they ever put that in. Uh, so this is Steve Chu, sort of looking at how we dismantle a W62, which is a big weapon <coughs> that we had no real use for, uh, but maintain the, the deterrent with the Russians. I'm showing these pictures because I like some of the pictures. And the question is how you then sustain those weapons that are left. As I mentioned, the weapons are not designed scientifically. They were, they were done by artists. These were artisans. These folks did this stuff by hand. And then you manufactured the pieces exactly the same way. You couldn't make them better. You couldn't make them more efficient because you didn't know whether they would work or not. And one of the reasons for that is that they tried to figure out how to make it more efficient a couple of times and the thing fizzled. So they said, oh, we're not going to do that anymore. <laughs> so they went back and back to the same old thing. NNSA, which is the nuclear National Security Agency, part of DOE, and the laboratories like Sandia, Los Alamos, Livermore, have to figure out how to adopt, instead of building weapons, maintaining weapons, and modernizing to the extent possible without testing weapons. And that's hard to do with people who don't know or care about it. Um, that's blah, blah, blah. So we get to stockpile stewardship. That's a Minuteman going off. You know, it's, it's a pretty picture. That's why I wouldn't put it up. OK, so our guys at, at the Nuclear Weapons Laboratory came up with this brilliant idea. They said, you know, we know how to make nuclear weapons more credible. We're going to put together this whiz-bang, super ginormous scientific facility that's going to be used to test nuclear weapons components and we're going to demonstrate to you, even if it's only going to cost a few billion dollars, that this is great stuff. And it's really for the nuclear weapons program. So they did some things. They did some reliability testing, fancy computers. And then they built a national ignition facility at Los, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Bunch of big lasers. Focusing down this little bitty target to see if you can test changing conditions, uh, whether you can get f a multiplication of energy that you put in. So it's a fusion reaction. I once went to, this is back in the day before the term whole round, for example, which I'll show you a picture of, was unclassified. It was classified. Before it was unclassified, I went to the Japanese government and said, you know, we got a problem. You guys are working on these laser fusion. We're doing it at Rochester, University of Rochester. They started doing it at Livermore and Sandia, doing it in other places. And you're publishing stuff that looks like it's classified. So, you know, we think that's a bad idea, letting nuclear weapons information out. So they said, well, go talk to our guys who are doing the work. And you can convince them that it's not a good idea. Everybody wanted to be a great scientist. They were doing these wonderful things. So I went to the Osaka laser physics laboratory. In, in Osaka, Japan. And I went and saw the director. Very nice guy. You know, he gives you the tea, you know, and all that kind of stuff. A couple of cookies. And I said, we think you're publishing some stuff that's really dangerous, especially on the multiplication from these whole round things which are still classified in the United States. And he looked at me and said, you guys from Livermore just called me up and told me you were coming. I don't agree with you. And then he said, it was in October, he had the leaves are beautiful in Kyoto this year. Why don't you go and take a look at them? He threw me out of his office. He was very nice. The tea was good. Uh, we undermined our own policy because these guys figured out that they wouldn't be able to attract anybody new to the laboratory unless they could do stuff that was whiz bang that they could publish. Because it was classified, you could be great and nobody knows it. So this nuclear national ignition facility, this gigantic thing in Livermore, which has not demonstrated it can do anything but basic science yet, but it does, has cost $6 billion, is a major part of the stockpile stewardship program. It's supposed to be doing interesting things. There's a target. That's the size of a target. That target, I don't know if you can see this very easily, 
those little things coming out of that little target are optical um, lenses for laser beams. And they focus down to a very small spot in the middle of that little red spot in the middle. So That's how big is the little square that the red spot is in the If I go back to the beginning, that little square is less than the size of the, the numbers on a penny. These guys are good. I mean, it's nanotech, at the time. it's spectacular stuff. Fancy crystals to drive the lasers. Fancy lasers. Scientific data published in the open literature. So their game is, and this is from last year in science, we can attract really young minds to this business of stockpile stewardship by doing this kabuki dance. We had this fantastic laser facility. We're doing great fusion research. And if you go to Livermore, they will tell you this is designed, this is what they're saying now, to create the energy future of the United States through laser fusion. There'll be no waste. We can, we can get a multiple of the, the energy we put into it, blah, blah, blah. And that's what they're doing. This has nothing to do with stockpile sewer stewardship, but it has a lot to do with attracting really smart people to the lab to use a facility which is the best in the world. And then when they get hooked, you know, and everybody's got to worry about their pension, then they start doing some of the other stuff. Even Sandia is doing some stuff. They're doing heat from inertial confinement fusion explosions, laser fusion. They're doing magnetic confinement to try to understand how to transfer the heat from those implosions to something you can use to boil water. That's basically what it is. But I'm just, this, I just show you to show that this is now open literature stuff. When I went to Japan the first time, this was top secret restricted data. One of the things we've been arguing, and I think that's probably a reasonable thing to argue, is that if you want to ensure the peaceful use of the physical material, you got to know about it yourself. And the US has basically gotten out of the civil nuclear energy business. So we're trying to understand how to get back into it so we can figure out what other people are doing. Uh, this sort of talks about that, but it's a detail. And this, I just think this is a great picture. How do you tell when somebody else has tested a nuclear weapon? It's one of the things about this whole business. I just went through the, uh, the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology, Mining and Geology with this spectacular seismic laboratory where well, they can pick up somebody. Well, how do you tell when some of the, one of the things you're picking up is, is a nuclear test? And since everybody's testing on the ground and we, the Iranians may do it, other people have done it. I mean, it's an interesting part of the whole trying to keep other people from getting nuclear weapons business. If you find out that they're doing it, you can punish them. If you don't know, they got away with it. But this is a different kind of picture. This is a, a 10,000 ton asteroid blowing up over Russia in 2013. It made a mess. People f at first thought it could have been a nuclear explosion. At first. Then there was no radiation, just a bunch of broken windows and all that. But these kind of things happen all the time. Earthquakes happen all the time. And Sandia does some really cool computer simulations. So that's just a nice picture. This is the forensic team exercise. If something goes off, let's forget a nuclear weapon, for example. Suppose somebody takes a bunch of waste from a hospital and packs it into a cylinder and goes into a metropolitan area, say New York, and blows it up in the subway. How do you know who did it? How do you know? You have to have some folks who can go down there and take a look, characterize the material, and see if they can trace it back to its origin. That's what nuclear forensics is all about. And it's complicated stuff. So here are the, the science and technology challenges. You gotta, you got to verify and monitor arms control agreements. You have to sustain nuclear weapons expertise. That's hard. I don't want to simplify it. That is really hard. As they discovered in the National Ignition Facility, all this fancy stuff is not going to help you. And if you don't test, what do you do? You have to come up with very different kind of computer simulations and other kind of non-nuclear explosive tests to verify that you're not, your stuff is not so old, it'll fizzle when you test it when you use it. And that's really interesting. 
forensics and, and archaeology, uh, materials control. There's all sorts of things you've got to do to make sure, and this is all science and technology, it's not policy, that we know what we're doing. It turns out, I, I think I tried to verify this quickly online, that Butte may be a part of this network. <laughs> Uh, where these are, these are seismic stations around the world trying to v monitor the comprehensive test bed treaty which the U.S. hasn't ratified yet which says you can't test anything. Uh, we're doing stuff in compliance with the treaty but this is to get to detect underground tests and that's a, an interesting exercise. You need geologists too. You need seismologists. This is the architecture. It's a pretty picture. The beauty of it is that this is one of the few internationally connected exercises to monitor nuclear weapons proliferation in the world. It's based in Vienna, nice place to live anyway, but it is incredibly sensitive. You can detect earthquakes at four magnitude by just doing, you know, correlations and stuff. And here, I think the smallest one they can detect is 4.6 if, if it's nearby. That's impressive. But they need people to maintain it. They need people to understand how it works, upgrade it, that kind of stuff. So nuclear workforce needs it. Since things have changed from back in the day where we were going to go and do all this with a couple of lasers and $6 billion, we got 6,300 employees at Livermore, 25% are going to retire over the next five years. Those are most of the scientists and engineers. That's a lot of jobs. And they're trying to attract the best people to help with this major national security exercise. And most of it is unclassified. Most of it is possible to do without going under the, you have to have classifications, security clearances that work there, but you don't, your publications are open. So it's attractive to young science and engineering types. Los Alamos has over 10,000 employees. 7,300 are in national security. They're going to lose 25% of the workforce as well. In fact, it's highly likely that half of the Department of Defense and Department of Energy employees are going to retire in the next 10 years. Half. And there are no replacements in the pipeline. That means they have to pay more. I mean, it's a good thing. You can't argue with it. And the areas, this is picked off the Los Alamos, the Livermore website. They're all the fields that folks here, students here, and faculty, by the way, because they want to grow up, grow up faculty into this stuff, because you get the faculty in, they play at the laboratories in the summer, it's really cool, the students come there, and then, you know, the web tightens, it's really not. But it's, it's everything you can think of. And that's what they were advertising last week. These are the areas those were specific jobs they were advertising last week. These are the areas they generally look for. I mean, it's sort of everything. The engineering piece is more broad than mechanical engineers. The trouble with nuclear weapons, they were done by guys who, you know, used their hands and <laughs> made molds and all that kind of stuff. And they were mostly mechanical engineers. Uh, those days are over. They need a lot of computer engineers, and they need a lot of electrical engineers. Uh, some civil engineering, maybe. Uh, but they need a lot of folks who know science at all levels. And they also need people who can develop games. Because part of the national security exercise is figuring out what somebody else is going to do if you do something. It's a game. It's a massive multi-dimensional computer game. And it's really cool to, to sit through some of these exercises, but somebody's got to design it. And somebody's going to make it realistic. Which means you also have to understand the mind of the other person. And one of the problems that the U.S. has had over time, and certainly in, in diplomacy, as we thought everybody thought like us, which has been proven over and over again to be just nonsense. For example, somebody would never think if they want to kill you of blowing themselves up. But well, no, no American would ever do that. That didn't work out too well. And there are other things like that that suggest we need to be much more culturally adept and understanding through anthropological studies and, and archaeological studies, because the history of a lot of this stuff matters more than the present, <coughs> and fold those in to the games we develop to understand how diplomacy is going to go. 
Here's other recruited job titles. And the list is everybody. <laughs> Even experimental particle physics. I'm, I'm a particle physicist, and someone would ask, well, why would you ever want an experimental, par experimental particle physics physicist doing nuclear weapons related stuff in the end? Well, it turns out that the best laboratory for nuclear weapons is in the cosmos, where you have supernova explosions, where you have magnetars, you have spinning neutron stars. They sort of mimic what a nuclear weapon looks like when it goes off. So if you can understand that kind of stuff, especially the neutrino piece of it, you can understand a lot about what's going on. One of the ways we're monitoring, we think we can monitor nuclear explosions underground is through neutrino physics. So you measure the fluxes of the neutrinos and you, you look for the variations. And if somebody sees a blip and you see a bunch of neutrinos coming from that blip, it's a gotcha, okay? Because neutrinos aren't produced very many other ways. So that's one of the things that they're looking for. And micro nanotechnologies, of course, but the world has changed. I mean, back, back in the old days, it was pretty straightforward. What we have now, because of being reasonable adults and not wanting to have overkill on something we're never going to use and spending billions of dollars a year to maintain them, is a change in paradigm. We want to maintain weapons we're never going to use so nobody else uses it. We want to keep other folks from getting weapons we never want to use in case they might want to use it, and, but not to bomb anybody, but to deter somebody from messing with them when they mess with somebody else. Ukraine is an example. Okay, the Russians move in. If the Russians didn't have nuclear weapons, trust me, they wouldn't have done it. It just wouldn't have happened. That is a big deal. The Iranians wanting nuclear weapons, or at least the capability, to be a counterpoint to the Saudis and the Israelis in the Middle East. They can't do anything else. I mean, they don't have the, the wherewithal to match the Saudis militarily, and the Israelis already have a few nuclear weapons. You know, you, it's, it's a different dynamic. So the world is changing, and the fluidity of it suggests that we need smart people to figure it out. And my generation, I have to confess, has screwed it up. We made it a little better, but we made it a lot worse in some ways. And the idea then is to use this as a vehicle. It's one of the very many vehicles we have, but use this as a vehicle for trying to make the whole world a better place by just getting a handle on the stuff. Understanding what we need and don't need, minimizing the stuff that we don't need, and trying to convince everybody else that it's a bad idea to have them just because we had them. That's it. Thank you. Sure. I always say questions. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning about the limited test ban treaty in 1963 and uh, about France and China being signatories. Did they join later? Because I understand they initially didn't. They joined later. Okay. All the nuclear weapon states, no, all the declared nuclear weapon states yeah. are signatories and have ratified the LB, uh, limited test ban treaty. The ones who haven't, ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty or us in India and Pakistan. And we, we, we're in a bad neighborhood on that one. Yeah. Yes? You use the phrase non-state actors. Do you refer to, what were you referring to? Oh, let's say ISIS, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram. I mean, lots of dogs and cats. I mean, there are all these independent groups not associated with the state who have the capability in some cases to develop this kind of technology or buy it. Okay. One of the biggest problems we have with North Korea is that they'll sell anything. And it's not clear they won't sell a nuclear weapon to somebody. And non-state actors are some who could do that. Pakistan, we worry about Pakistan, the security of nuclear weapons. Less that they would use them against India, or you can't rule that out, but more that somebody would steal one of them or buy one of them in the black market and then you got a problem. It's a non-state actor threat that is very difficult to deal with. What do you do if you're trying to deal, for example, in Syria with, with ISIS and they got a nuclear weapon? You know, I mean, the Israelis have a reason to worry about that one, I tell you, that's, that's a scary one. 
If you would elaborate uh, a bit, so <clears throat> why didn't Reagan want to simply bomb those developing facilities in North Korea? And, and, and then by extension, why don't we bomb the developing facilities in Iran today? It seems that Clinton was very successful with airstrikes in Iraq, right? So the model's there, so why not? Okay, uh, let me give you an answer, which is my opinion and no one else's. It's, it's not for attribution, and if I say something, I'll shoot myself. Okay. Um, Ronald, Ronald I, I, I have, from a foreign policy perspective, almost no respect for Ronald Reagan in a number of areas. One is the whole not proliferation of nuclear weapons. He gave, what can I say? Yeah, he's dead, so it's not that big. He gave a green light to Pakistan to develop nuclear weapons. And I was in the room when he did it. Just, just enough to make you crazy, OK? Because we, well, he gave the green light. When we brought the information back on South Korean willingness, without a fingerprint from us, to go in and take out that, that facility, he said, you know, I don't want to risk a war on the Korean Peninsula. At that time, the North Koreans couldn't beat themselves. I mean, they had basically no army. They had 1950 equipment from the Chinese. The South Koreans would have just run over them. It would have been a laugh. He just didn't want to bother. I mean, it was almost that simple. He didn't want to bother. The question about Iran is more complicated because there are too many wars in the Middle East now. And we haven't won the last few we fought. <laughs> so you go in and bomb Iran. Well, the Iranians will react, and they will probably not react directly by confronting us, but they have this terror network, which is non-trivial, and they'll get you, okay? So is it worth it? It's, it's better to go to the negotiating table and try to cut a deal than to not and end up with something that's sufficiently uncertain that it becomes a catastrophe in the end. That's, that's a problem with Yes. But back to that same topic. I mean, in, in terms of Korea, how difficult is it to just build another graphite pile? And in terms of Iran, wasn't there a, a highly designed worm that changed the spin rates of the center fuges that they think was engineered by the United States and Israel? So, so it's kind of be direct bombing, I guess? So the guy who leaked that just got convicted of espionage and he's <laughs> caught in jail. I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> The example of not being able to rebuild is Iraq, Ozirak. They, they had a reactor going up, and we told the Israelis that that reactor, it looked like the reactor they have at Demona. In fact, it was a carbon copy. It was a French-designed reactor. And we said, look, it's not designed to produce fissionable material in sufficient quantities that you're going to you know, have a problem. And the biggest problem was not, it was not the reactor itself, because it was small. It was the laboratories that Swiss were supplying. So a few of us went over and briefed with Nock and Begin. And we said, look, you know, this is not the problem. You shouldn't worry about this. If you want to worry about something, worry about the Swiss laboratories and talk to the Swiss. And he said, you worry about what you want to worry about, and I'll worry about what I want to worry about. Two weeks later, they blew up the reactor and wiped out the infrastructure. It's the people you kill. So, and they never recovered. If you go in and take out a graphite pile with 45% of the Korean science and engineering folks working on it, they're not going to recover. For a decade or two, that buys you a lot of time. So you not only blow up the facility, let me put it gently, you kill people. <laughs> and that's what drives the train. Weren't they doing, wasn't there, they, wasn't there high profile assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists. Oh, yeah, I mean, this stuff goes on all the time. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, the, the reason the why the Israelis, it, it wasn't just the Stuxnet, which is this, this virus that it is alleged <clears throat> the U.S. and the Israelis sort of pirated into the uh, Nantes in particular and wiped out some of the centrifuges. It was the Israelis going around shooting some of these guys. Uh, and the, the idea behind taking out an Iranian facility Poor force means you're going to take out the workforce. You can't just blow the facility up. You've got to take out the workforce. You've got to take out the know-how. And one thing is true about the Iranian scientists. These are really smart people. 
and they work like hell. I mean, Persia invented the world, right? I mean, these are really, really smart people, and they, they work hard, and they're really good engineers, and that's the problem. And it's 1970s. No, it's 70 year old technology, it's 1944, 1945 technology. I mean, we made, we made enriched uranium for the nuclear weapon that we didn't have to test because we knew it worked the first time. And these big canyons with all this noise and, and, and everybody should have seen it and nobody knew it was there, okay? Well, you shrink it down by a factor of 100. This is not hard stuff. That's the problem, it's just not hard stuff. It's, it's people that drive it. Yes. A uh, question is, you mentioned, you mentioned Ukraine. Uh, so in your opinion, I know back in the 1990s and after Ukraine became independent from the Soviet Union with the break after 1991, there was all the concern because there were a number of Soviet uh, nuclear weapons in now independent Ukrainian territory. And there was that deal that Clinton brokered uh, when he was president to get those missiles out. And basically the Ukrainians gave them up. Um, given what's happened now in Ukraine, you see that as deal was a mistake or was, your, was Ukraine too unstable to have them? They were, Ukrainians had that nuclear weapon capability. I mean, those, those were their weapons. And they cut a deal, was signed by the US, the UK, and the Russians, saying if you take, if you give up your nuclear weapons, we'll be nice to you, we're not gonna mess with you. In fact, we'll even help you out, you know? We'll, we'll help you with your economy, blah, blah, blah. Well, it didn't work out too well, right? <laughs> uh, but if you take a look at where the Ukrainians are with the Russian infiltration in the Dantesk and other places, what are you gonna do with nuclear weapons? I mean, the only thing the Ukrainians could have done with nuclear weapons is drop them on Russian territory. Okay, that's very nice. The Russians have a thousand times the number of weapons. So what they do is they take out Eastern Ukraine. Who is gonna to go to war with the Russians over that? I mean, so, it's a wash, I think. Uh, but the, without nuclear weapons, and the Russians having them, who's gonna mess with the Russians so they take over Ukraine? There was this thought, okay, so what happens if the Russians now get away with Ukraine, get away with Eastern Ukraine, and they go into Estonia? Okay, so Estonia is a part of NATO. Do you think the Brits are gonna go to war over Russians' annexation of, of Estonia? I mean, I wouldn't put 50 cents on that. They're a part of NATO. It's just because the Russians have a non-trivial response, if necessary. That's, that's, a, that's the issue with, with that force posture of nuclear weapons. I love Estonia, by the way. It's a very nice place. They bring the food. Can you go back to the picture of your Hiroshima? Oh, really? OK, so you want me to? <laughs> Let's go to escape. Let's go to the top. Anybody keeping up with that? Okay, good. You're almost there. So the very interesting thing about that picture is that there's a lot of the town is totally level. Mm -hmm. And a few of these buildings, I mean, were those like the only big cement brick buildings in the town and everything else was little stuff? Or what, I mean, and, and we've got some engineers and stuff in the audience, and so you think, okay, you have this great big nuclear blast, small by today's standards, but still big by that standards, huge damage. Yeah. But some things look like they're, they, they look like they're sort of gutted a little bit on the inside, but the structure looks pretty safe. This picture is a thermonuclear blast in the Pacific, near the Bikini Atoll, and those little dots are US warships, okay? The battleships, the carriers, they're the ones that we're scuttling. This, you take, this is a big blast. It's, you know, several megatons. At the end of the blast, there were <coughs> entire ships that only had the top taken off and the rest of it was still there. It simply depends on the angle of the blast. It depends on where you are in the shock. It depends on all sorts of things. Those buildings were really substantial. <laughs> you take a look at them. And these buildings can sustain, they, they can sustain. These are the buildings that'll, that'll sustain 
a, a magnitude nine earthquake. You know, and, and some of them just won't fall down. Uh, they're not big, they're not tall, but they are probably all you know, poured concrete with rebar up the, the yin yang, all the, wood, the windows are blown out. You probably wouldn't walk around inside of it very much, but the structure has integrity. And it's 1923, and Franklin Wright built the only building in, in downtown Tokyo that survived the 1923 earthquake. Yeah, you um, can do it. These well, guys. The Japanese cities in particular, I like to say the German ones that were bombing conventional bombs too, those were most, you know, probably all those other buildings were probably pretty much like wood. You know, that's where it's. Some like, of them were, but some of them were yeah. uh, factories, yeah, okay. and they were, they were steel construction. Well, it's still construction without some sort of substantial sort of base and a lot of concrete, they're just going to collapse. And a lot of them melted. I mean, if you're near ground zero, you melt. Okay? And you're not going to melt concrete. It just doesn't get hot enough. But this, I mean, what's interesting is that a few, one of the buildings you can see, uh, if you can pick out the dome, just to the uh, far right, that's, that's the memorial now in Oshawa. That's where they built the fence around it and did an uh, atomic bomb memorial. It wasn't much left. I mean, it's a skeleton, <laughs> but it was there. It stood up. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, if you if you engineer things right, you can survive a lot. None of this stuff would survive a ten kiloton, a ten megaton blast. I mean, forget about it. Just just because it's so hot, you know, it just and it's so hot quickly, and then the blast is so extraordinary. I mean, it just. I mean, maybe that building in the foreground might have, but not much else would have. Wasn't that air detonated too? A couple hundred feet above the ground. It was there, didn't it? You know, didn't, didn't land, but you know, it, it depends on the shock. And the, the shock is, is everything. It, it, the blast and shock are the things that do the initial damage, and the fire does everything else. I mean, the, most of those other buildings probably got burnt to the ground, you know, just because of the fire and the heat. And these big concrete structures didn't. The blast will, will flatten the stuff that can flatten, and then everything is burnt up. And then everybody gets radiation sick and dies anyway. So. Any more questions? So somebody, somebody in the front row has got to ask a question. Yeah. Somebody in the front row has to ask a question. <laughs> yes. I will. <laughs> Do you think that some of the problems we have today with other countries developing these weapons, do you think that we kind of opened the can to all that when we bombed Japan? Or do you think it would have happened eventually anyway? I think the problem with nuclear weapons and other countries wanting them is that they're useful. They're just useful. I mean, with the, the North Koreans have demonstrated their utility. The Pakistanis and Indians have demonstrated their utility. The Chinese demonstrated the utility. They became part of the big boy club because they had nuclear weapons. In the 50s, they demonstrated the utility of nuclear weapons. It's got, it's got the problem that the, the damn things are useful. Okay? Even if you don't use them, they're useful. And that's, that's the problem with nuclear weapons. So the Iranians want them as a counterpoint to the Israelis. And the Saudis will say, if they get them, we're going to get them because they're not going to outdo us. And the Saudis can get them lots of ways. They can buy them. They're not going to go and build an infrastructure. It just takes too long and it's too expensive. But they can find other ways of, of doing it. So it's, nuclear weapons are useful. That was part of, the, part of the nuclear force posture determination. If anybody else has them, you've got to have them. We. Have them because we are, you know, better than everybody else. I wouldn't put money on that statement either, but at least we think we are. And at the moment, people rely on us to tamp down stupidities elsewhere, even though we can't tamp them down too well here. But that, that international role for the United States is probably predicated on us having nuclear weapons. So, thank you. Thank you. I have one technical question. I came here and there's no snow. What's the story? <laughs> <laughs>